My name's Paul Reid. Uh, I was part of the VSI program. Uh, I was previously a footballer for, for 19 years and then have progressed into strategic roles within sport. My most recent one being Academy Director at Southern Football Club. Perfect. And uh, first question, straight into it. So what, what drove you towards the um, Sporting Director program at VSI? So the program was something that I've been thinking about for a, a long time. I was coming to the end of my football career. I realised that my, my knees were creaking, the, the back was starting to get sore and uh, the end was nigh. Uh, I was always looking for that bespoke programme that was going to upskill me in the area that I was interested in, which is leadership within sport. Uh, the course itself was something that I had planned to do a couple of years earlier. Um, kind of logistics didn't, didn't fit in to, to do that at that time. Uh, but after I did a bit more research and spoke to some of the people that had been on the course, it was a no-brainer really. Every, everything that I heard and, and seen tick boxes for me. And I just felt that it was a real chance to put some kind of academic learning behind my experiences and, and ideas. And how has the programme benefited you, your career, your knowledge in terms of what you learned and how you managed to utilise that in the, in the workplace? So making a transition away from being a, a footballer into a sports business is, is a big jump. Um, there's lots of transferable skills and portable skills, but it, it is difficult. And I would credit the programme with really helping me make that jump. Um, I can actually give a specific example where I was sat with the uh, the future owner of Sunderland and I was talking about how I would run a football club and how I would structure it and basically repeating some of the, the learnings that I got from the programme. Uh, it wasn't long after this uh, chance kind of conversation that he was offered the opportunity to buy Sunderland Football Club. And I think that that conversation stuck in his mind. I think that we hopefully always had a good relationship and he always thought positively of me. But I really think that conversation where I was passing on that knowledge was a real kind of moment for him where he realised that I was someone that he could trust to uh, be within an organisation as big as Sunderland. And obviously working, that's a great example of, of networking and working in senior levels of sport involves so much of that on a daily basis. Um, how I mean, VSI has got assigned quite a specific network as well. How did you tap into that and how have you used that to open doors for yourself? Yeah, so I would consider myself a decent networker without really understanding how and why I was doing it. I think generally I'm just good with people. So when, when I was a player, I would go into the exec boxes and see the sponsors because morally I felt that if they were supporting the football club, then the least I could do was go, go and have a chat off the back of that. Then again, without me really knowing it, I was creating a network. What the, the programme did was get me out of being one dimensional because I'd spent my whole life within football. My contacts and my relationships were predominantly within the football world. What VSI did was, first of all, the, the core horse I was on was very eclectic. People from athletics, cricket, um, and, and different backgrounds really helped uh, give a different insight into conversations. So that and, that, and that in turn helped my network. So once you develop those relationships with the cohort within your class, then you start to tap into people they know and getting a warm introduction to someone is a lot different from just kind of calling someone out the blue. I think if uh, a, lot, a lot of people and a lot of leaders within sport I have reached out to on, on platforms like LinkedIn, they've been very kind to meet me for a coffee, but I think that warm introduction makes uh, a big difference. And was there any particular aspects of the programme which you you really enjoy, in fact, you got the most from in terms of maybe a guest speaker or a particular module? I'd say the one thing that sticks out was the, the opportunity we got to go to uh, Glasgow Rangers Football Club. We had Mark Allen, who was a uh, director of football at Glasgow Rangers at that time. He was in uh, our class and he so happened to be in our small group that 
we got put together to analyze high performing organizations i think that was the real kind of standout moment for me where we were doing the academic learning and i was really starting to understand the frameworks and structures that were being talked about in class but to actually see it in a real life situation and and actually see mark with his expertise and how he's implemented those structures that we've been talking about in class into an actual football club was brilliant uh, also uh, around that while we were there the the staff at rangers were very candid with us they they trusted us with their intellectual property um allowed us to interview them and i just felt the the learning from from that trip was was really rich if someone is is watching this and thinking of joining the program is there any particular advice you might give them as to why they should do it or what they should do maybe before joining vsa i think the thing that i probably look back on and self-reflect is if i was going to be critical why didn't i do it sooner there's always there's always a reason not to do it at, at the point that i was kind of thinking about it and not doing it it was the geography it was can i commit the time and honestly once once you sign up you you, you make the time and once you really delve into the program you're actually so interested in it that your mind's buzzing 100 miles an hour all the time i would i would drive long distances to uh, the university of salford and the whole four or five hours on the way back home, my mind would be buzzing. I'd have made a lot of notes on different books that I wanted to read. And usually I would have downloaded one of those and listened to a, an audio book on the, on the way home. Uh, the, the program itself, I think, ticks a key component for anybody looking at strategic roles within sport. I think I, I was lucky that I had the kind of real life experience of, of being a footballer, so I've been in and around it. I've now uh, branched out into getting those senior executive positions within sport, so I've, I've now got some knowledge around that. But to actually have some academic learning and a real framework and understanding, I, I think that will make people stand out from the field. Brilliant. And to go, I'll move on to the uh, interview now with um, looking at your kind of your career, especially the academy side of things. Um, so when, when a club is looking at a youngster to maybe recruit them into their academy, I mean, how much work goes into looking at their their personal circumstances, their maybe psychological profile? Because how much does that influence what they do in training and then on a match day? Yeah, so while recruiting to uh, look at signing players for the academy, there's a, there's a real uh, well-rounded approach. So everything kind of just builds up a little picture. So not one thing is the defining reason, but everything builds up a picture and their kind of psychological profile is certainly one of them. We're, we're looking at younger players, what their attitude's like, um, when they're losing, when things aren't going their way, when it's when referee decisions go against them, whether they're coachable, because that kind of flash of talent that you do see in a player is all well and good, but to actually nurture that and, and bring it through needs that coachability uh, and attitude. I, I would class attitude and, uh, and personality as the biggest attribute within football. You can be, you can be quick, you can be strong, you can uh, have a great range of passing, but unless you've got the actual desire and dedication and ability to listen, then you're going to come up short and that, that potential is going to uh, not be fulfilled. And also, you, you joined Sunderland kind of during a fairly difficult period in time for the club um, on and off the pitch. But despite that, was, was the opportunity to kind of go in and shake that academy? Was it just too good to turn down? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, no secret that the, the club has uh, faced some difficult years. Uh, I went in off the back of the first team being relegated in successive seasons from the, the Premier League all the way down to League One. The academy had obviously felt the, the knock-on effects from that. But even in hindsight, I would still take the opportunity. Uh, the, the chance to go into a club as big as Sunderland the chance to actually go in and, and really shape something from the ground up. There, I, I would describe my period at, 
uh, Sunderland as a real time of accelerated learning. So I was there just over two years, but the amount of issues that I had to deal with, the amount of things that I had to really start from scratch on, feels that the amount of learning that I did get from that time uh, spanned more than those just over two years. Well, obviously, despite the circumstances, um, you helped the, the academy retain its Category 1 status. And what kind of work did you have to undertake and do to, to ensure that that happened? There's, there's not long enough to tell you the amount of things that we needed to do to, to actually get to that point. Uh, to give some context, before I came into the role at, at Sunderland, there hadn't been an academy manager for a spell. Uh, the previous uh, person had, had stepped away and had been a number of months where no one was in the position. So things had, had slipped through, through kind of no one's fault really, but thing, things had slipped. And I was walking into somewhere that needed a complete overhaul. So all the way from setting values, all the way down to what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, everything needed looked at and not just adjusted, it needed ripped up and, and started again because we were a, we were a different club. We, we weren't in the Premier League anymore. We had to think differently, work differently. We had to be resourceful. We had to innovate. And our working practices had to reflect that. So it's it's easy to go in and, and kind of shoehorn my ideas into the into the club and into the academy, but I didn't think that was right. So the, the first thing we did was collaborate and, and really understand what the values were and what they should be at, at Sunderland and kind of set that as a a starting point and, and work down from there. But it really it really was uh, a huge task and, and something I'm, I'm very proud of and uh, very thankful for the, the staff there that helped me achieve that. And it's obviously increasingly rare for clubs outside of the Premier League, um, let alone kind of League One, to have that Category One academy. What was the expe expectation from the club um, for the academy that needed to happen versus maybe the reality of the situation which you found yourself in? Yeah, so I think uh, inside the club, the expectations were pretty realistic. I think people understood that we were uh, competing with the absolute elite, that there was a real disconnect between being Cat One and League One, uh, opposite ends of the building. Uh, at League One, in terms of the first team, we do have to kind of cut our cloth accordingly. We have to adjust uh, and still obviously aspire to to go forwards, but we need to understand where we are. Whereas at Cat One level, I'm competing with the, the Man Cities, the Liverpools, the Man United of the world, uh, and it really is a, an elite environment. So within the club, there was understanding that we, we faced some obvious challenges. I think externally it was, it was more difficult that people didn't want to hear about short term pain. Uh, the, the football club had gone through enough of that and mm -hmm. to see the kind of the academy be the real platform to bounce the club back up. Unfortunately, with the, the budget restrictions and the amount of things that we're having to contend with, that wasn't possible. The, the way that we kept Cat 1 status uh, from previously being in special measures before coming into the football club will probably never get the credit that it deserves. But believe me, uh, when people look back, it will be a, a huge achievement. You touched on it um, previously, but how important is it for a club's values to be evident from the academy then right through to its first team? I think it's really important. I think I, I use a phrase, uh, you can't referee a game if the players don't understand the rules. So if, if we're expecting certain behaviour, language and actions from people, then we have to really showcase and get them to understand what we expect from them. And those those values are kind of what, what I see as the, as the first step to that, that. These are the things we expect. These are the things that we'll be looking for from you as a player and as a person. I think if you can have that kind of uniformed alignment right the way from the academy to the first team, then you've got a whole organisation all pulling in the same direction. Paul, thank you very much for your time today.